lead in our own economy, which in which employment is now nearly 50% as a consequence of failure of ANC policies on the one hand, and uh, the structural inheritance of apartheid on the other, and now COVID. So those three triple whammies together have led to a, a, a dire economic situation uh, of, of 10 years of lost growth. Um, and then, of course, the IMF loan that South Africa has just taken, and the fact that we are borrowing much more heavily from in the international community makes us more vulnerable to external influences. And let me just conclude with three brief points. We know from South Africa's own settlement that you need three broad ingredients to make settlements happen. You need an awareness internally that there's more to be gained by settlement than by continuing on the path that you're on. And I think you have to ask yourself, is ZANU-PF in that position? Is, are the costs of continuing on this path sufficiently high enough for ZANU to, to want to sue for peace? The second one, and this really speaks to what Todd and, and Stephen were ch chatting about, is the need for external consensus in pushing the different parties to the table. Is the whole international community using all the tools at their disposal to push the parties to the table? And then, of course, what Tendai mentioned, you need leadership. You need someone who can do this. You need someone who can, if necessary, broker this. You need timing and you need method. But I would say, at least from a South African vantage, given the, the heating or the brewing storm in South Africa's own economy, that the moment is increasingly ripe. It may not be ripe enough yet, but it's increasingly ripe for South Africa to take a much harder look at what's going on in Zimbabwe uh, uh, and, and try and find a way to address this, without which we are, I think, increasingly feel we could not only suffer the consequences of no benefit, but suffer the consequences of failure. And the, very importantly, and this is my very last point, the weakening of the image of the ANC in terms of that liberation ethos uh, and mythology, the fact that people are being so clearly and openly and regularly abused and their human rights trampled in Zimbabwe does affect the ANC. And that's, I think, the, the, perhaps the, the most powerful point to be made in this engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Greg. Um, just one uh, question, and that would be, um, how far then are we from a situation in which South Africa will push for a settlement in Zimbabwe, in your view? Well, I think it's I think it's brewing. Uh, I mean, I, I don't I, I I think the parties in Zimbabwe have to steer that debate in South Africa. And if it's not going to be ZANU PF, and I don't see why there's going to be any interest in them uh, to do that yet, at least. Uh, it's going to have to be the MDC who takes a position of uh, the moral high ground, uh, as it were, in terms of finding uh, a way forward for some sort of uh, transitional arrangement leading to those elections and making that point clear. Um, so it's, it's not one thing, Violet. I think it's going to be a series of pressures and a series of opportunities. But I would argue that COVID has probably almost definitely increased the chances of some sort of transitional arrangement, some sort of settlement, uh, uh, rather than worsen them. Undoubtedly, things are probably going to get nastier before they get better, um, because that's the nature uh, of, of, of such regimes. But uh, certainly, I think South Africa is feeling the effects of its failure in Zimbabwe. Okay, no, thank you very much for that, um, uh, uh, Greg Mills. Um, our last uh, speaker is uh, Patrick Smith, and then we will allow um, some of the uh, viewers on Zoom to contribute. Now I see we have more than 400 um, uh, people watching on Zoom right now, and quite a few have expressed um, uh, they, 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 they want to, to, to contribute. So you can start raising your hands, and as soon as Patrick Smith 
is finished, then we can start bringing in some of you to uh, contribute. Uh, Patrick Smith um, from the Africa Report and Africa Confidential, so much has been said, but um, maybe from you, if you can just give us your thoughts in terms of what you think now is the way forward for Zimbabwe, and you've been writing about Zimbabwe for many years also. Um, thanks, Violet. Um, yeah, perhaps I most usefully could talk about what I've seen as a reporter uh, running around Africa over the years, looking at transitions uh, in a range of different places, Nigeria, Ghana, where both uh, transitioned out of military regimes into multi-party uh, open political systems. Um, also, um, Liberia, Sierra Leone, trans transiting from a war zone, uh, to, uh, to, again, civilian multi-party regimes, South Africa, of course, which is sort of sui generis in its own way. Um, but more, most recently, um, I, and I was saying this to Dr. Mandaza yesterday, uh, Sudan, I think, offers, uh, despite being a, a, to a very different country from Zimbabwe in so many ways, and I don't think either the National Islamic Front regime nor ZANU-PF would rel relish anyone comparing the two regimes. I think they do have something in common. Um, and moving the way that the Sudanese opposition galvanized over, over 30 years of uh, dictatorship, essentially from uh, 89 to, to last year, and, and what they did with that massive demonstration Half a million people gathered outside the military defense headquarters in Khartoum. And to give you a sense of what they were up against, um, the Sudan regime presided uh, under the National Islamic Front regime under Omar al-Bashir, presided over the deaths of uh, two million people in South, South Sudan and at least a million people in various wars in Nuba Mountains, Kordofan, Darfur and so on within Sudan. Um, so it, it was one of the most ruthless regimes up there with Saddam Hussein and Bashir al-Assad. Um, and the Sudanese put together this opposition. I think there's an awful lot that can be gained from looking at what they did. Extremely disciplined, uh, avowedly non-violent. There was just no point in being violent because there was no way, even with the numbers, you were going to be able to confront the, the Sudanese uh, military and intelligence services. Um, and having then formed, and what was really interesting was the way they formed alliances with dissidents within the Sudanese military who realized that what Bashir had done was lead the country into a very bloody cul-de-sac. And it was just going to get worse and worse for successive generations after him. As a, as a 78 year old, and I think Manangag was 77, he had no real interest in, in, in the future more than a few more years, uh, essentially as, as running the country. So I think, I, I think there's something to really be gained in what they did and how they then triggered this negotiating process in Sudan, which um, is not so far away from what is being talked about in Zimbabwe as this national transitional authority. So um, just to be very quick, I'd say uh, the key things that have come out of what happened in Sudan that might be relevant for Zimbabwe is that the, the participants, the key participants, were the people, the, the civil society organizations, the trades unions played a major role, the professional associations, the, the Doc Sudan Doctors Association, one was one of the leading lights in, in, in the opposition movement just as it has been in some respects in Zimbabwe. You have a very similar corpus of professional, responsible professionals in civil society organized, the workers' organizations and so on, um, above and beyond the parties. No disrespect to, uh, to the MDC and the other opposition parties who, as Tendai have, has said, have endured a hell of a lot just to stay in business as, as political entities. But the, the issue in, in, in Sudan was that the, there was a much wider range of, of activism drawing from the streets and the communities. And that really, uh, really put pressure on the, on, on the government and, and finding ways of making alliances, weird alliances, but alliances nevertheless, with dissidents within the military, within the police, 
to get political change. And that's what they started when they pushed out uh, Omar al-Bashir in April 2020, uh, 2019 and started this process of change. So I don't think it's beyond the wit of uh, the political entities in Zimbabwe to do that. But I think it, it, it takes looking at what happened in Sudan um, as, it, as the possibility of drawing on some useful examples from there. So, so, so Patrick, is the um, NCP the kind of um, like Sudan movement that Zimbabwe needs? Um, so the NCP. Um, yeah. Well, um, what? Um, oh, I, I said for, for Zimbabwe. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think there there are there are similarities. Yes, I mean because what the the Sudan revolu well they, they regard themselves as revolutionaries because they were overthrowing a, a not just a, a regime but a, a way of running government a and they started very much with this gra these grassroots committees in the regions uh, or organizing on a community and street basis bringing people not just together for sort of making political judgments but also saying okay you've got a health emergency here Let's talk to the guy down the street who's got a small pharmaceutical company, get some drugs to that community, providing benefits. It wasn't just politics. It was actually it was a material benefit. Uh, teachers and le university lecturers had a responsibility to work with communities. And it was all part of this revolutionary movement. So I think it's yes. I, and I think that 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 goes into revitalizing uh, civil society and, ma and, and make, making sure it's it's autonomous and it has its own agenda and can really contribute to the process of change alongside the established political parties and uh, whatever ent other entities are in the mix. Okay, no, thank you very much for that, uh, Patrick Smith. So now um, I'd like to take some uh, contributions, questions, comments from the floor. We have quite a number of people who have raised their hands. So please I ask you to keep your contributions very brief. And I also ask the panelists to keep their answers very brief because we need to finish by um, seven o'clock or eight o'clock um, in Zimbabwe time. So let me, I'll just go from the top going down. Um, who is the first one there? Just a sec, I've just lost my chat. <laughs> I think it's Sherman Ban. No, 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 no. Just bear with me. Uh, Chorus Nyamakunda. Can you unmute? Yes. First of all, I would like to respond to Patrick Smith. Patrick Smith, the methods you are talking about Sudan and other countries, the Zampiev government, the Zimbabwe government is fully aware the Zimbabweans have tried that. I think there are other methods that are, that involve um, not letting blood. There are other methods that can be used. That's my response to that. Um, whatever organization trying to try, the government would still be fully aware. You can't do anything secret without the government knowing. And number two, um, getting back to Greg Mills, the when when the ANC came to power. They had more than two thirds majority, so they had absolute power to do anything. The change of politics in South Africa, which you mentioned, um, is it denting the ANC and also the opposition parties in South Africa? Are they speaking with the same voice? Is the Zimbabwean issue an issue for those opposition parties? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take two more for now, and then we'll we'll get the panelists to respond. So, panelists, please, can you keep a note of the questions that you've been asked, and then you can come and respond towards the end. Um, the next one is Oswald. Oswald Moyo. Can you unmute Oswald? Yes, yes, I've done so. Um, thank you, thank you, Violet. Um, um, actually, I, I, I think I have a contribution. I think um, the people of Zimbabwe generally, they underestimate uh, the history the history of, of, of ZANU-PF and how actually ZANU-PF got into power. From 1980, uh, you realize that uh, the 1980 elections were disputed and were contested, and up to date, we don't know who won the election. They purport Robert Mugabe, but some Zipra still say, no, Joshua Ngomo 
won the elections. That's why up to date, even in the National Archives, we don't have the ballot box or the ballot papers, I mean to say, they went away with Lord Soames. So firstly, the election thing has failed for a long time to resolve the Zimbabwean crisis of governance. And on another important issue, I believe that the, the opposition itself has not been uh, strong um, it has been weakened within, and uh, whenever the opposition try to, 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 to make maybe strides and reforms within itself, it is penetrated. Of recent, we have seen the Kupe Munzora function, also after the, the, the demise of uh, Dr. Morgan Richard Chang Rai. But actually, the opposition also has even lost the organic intellectuals that it used to have. These included the workers. Uh, so now the opposition, actually, when we look from its founding grounds, it has also lost the gist with the people. And if you look largely, the marginalized communities, especially the peasants, they do not know the ideology of the opposition. So I believe it's high time also the opposition in Zimbabwe should contentize the people. They have tried of recent to do that. But I believe there is more to this that they should do. And I believe everyone knows that the Zimbabwean situation has just reached the, an, a, an alarming level. And the people need leadership to fight. So we lack um, a real leadership from the opposing political parties okay. because they are divided. So that's what I, I, I generally think uh, is the problem, which also must be. Thank you, Oswald. We'll get Tendai Biti to respond to that. Um, next, Sherman Banna. Hi, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I just want to um, refer to the last speaker who spoke about the Sudanese case. Firstly, we've got to really, really understand when we do comparisons, um, different socioeconomic cases. In Sudan, we've got a very, very small middle class. And so a lot of people were predominantly on the same level and had very rarely nothing to lose and could take to the streets and demonstrate in a way, whether it was peaceful or violent. What we have in Zimbabwe is a vast difference in classes, okay? And that's due to the large diaspora kind of um, base. So you get a lot of people who have a lot to lose, and that's a reality on the ground. You've got people, um, you spoke about certain professionals and doctors and pharmaceuticals who could contribute to the um, local community and whatever the case may be. In Zimbabwe, we've got certain people of certain caliber who, don't, who have so much to lose for looking after the next caliber that it's very impractical to be united. So we've got so many classes of people who look out for their own benefit, and that's why cohesion in any sense of opposition is so far-fetched. That's number one. So uniting as an opposition to any kind of government or any kind of um, any kind of government or any kind of dictatorship is very, very difficult because of this, the vast differences in benefit and the vast difference in class. And that's a dynamic okay. that we can't control due to our diaspora community. That's number one. The second thing that I wanted to add was, um, well, basically that's, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. And uh, in this round, I'll take one more from Edison Capondo. Edison, can you unmute? We can't, okay. Ali? Yes. Good evening. Hi, Edison, we can hear you. Um, I, I think um, uh, what I can say from my own point of view is for, most people don't understand our situation here in Zimbabwe and it contribute um, sustainably. We really need to understand where we are coming from, where we are, and the most uh, effecting, effective thing which can be done, whilst you are focusing on where we are coming from and where we are right now. Uh, if we are to think of we, 
literally don't have like any industry running at the moment. And there's no need for us at this particular moment to have a current, which is called a Zimbabwean dollar. It's just kind of a form of current, which, which is simply disturbing the pattern, which is simply disturbing the entire economics of the nation. And what kind of people are we dealing with? Then we go back to the grassroots. What can we do as a Zimbabwean effectively, collectively, to fight against our common enemy? Thank you. Thank you, Edson. So let me start with uh, Tendai Biti. Um, the question from Oswald about the uh, opposition, he seems to say the opposition needs to do more and that uh, there's uh, lacking real leadership. What can you say about that briefly, please? Uh, look, I think that, uh, I think that uh, there is a, a lack of appreciation of the role of an um, opposition. We can't, we can't go ahead of the people. If we go ahead of the people, we leave them uh, suspended. If we go ahead of the people, we expose them to a particularly brutal regime. We saw what it did on the 1st of August, uh, 2018. We saw what it did in January, uh, 2019. So our role, and we've been doing this, is to steer the ship to, to, to confront in such a way that uh, we are able to remain standing uh, the morning after because we, we know of ZANU-PF. It is the same party that killed our people, 30,000 uh, during uh, uh, Gugura Hundo. Over the years, we have uh, led the protest, we have led the struggle. You remember uh, from the days of uh, the final push, uh, the days of uh, March uh, 2007, 11 March uh, 2007, the violence which we took uh, in, 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 in 2008. And sometimes we don't direct, we don't provide direct leadership. We work through and with other, uh, you know, 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 organizations. Uh, what I want to, what I want to say, uh, particularly connected to, I think it was Chairman, is that firstly, the MDC Alliance is a huge, humongous uh, organization, and don't make the mistake of judging it. Uh, from the top, uh, from the the challenges which we are having with the likes of Kupe and uh, and the Monzora, judge it from the ground how organic uh, this movement is, and what a huge, humongous uh, mass organization uh, you know you know you know you know it, it is. Secondly, I beg to differ uh, with uh, Sherman when he says that uh, there are Zimbabweans with a lot of to lose and therefore you will not have a homogeneous uh, uh, response uh, to the crisis. First, let's separate, uh, you know, you know, you know, ZANU-PF and the likes of Nangagwa, the small elites that you find in these cartels. And they're not more than 40 people. They're not more than 40 people that you find in all these huge companies. They're not more than 40 people. The rest of the Zimbabweans, including the middle class, including people who own business, are carrying the huge burden brought by ZANU-PF, the burden of illegitimacy, the burden of incompetence, the burden of extractiveness, the burden of predatoriness. So we are at that stage, which, which the left would call the National Democratic Revolution, the National Democratic stage, where we are all in it together. It doesn't matter whether you're middle class, it doesn't matter whether you own a business, it doesn't matter whether you are a student, it doesn't matter whether you are a peasant. And, and that's why I said in my address, there is an obligation on all of us Zimbabweans to provide uh, the agency. But of course, the MDC must take the lead. And I have no doubt that we've been taking the lead. That's why even in things that we're not involved directly, look at 31st July 2020. We didn't call for it, but Mchinamasa in his response, ZANU-PF in his response, it targeted the MDC alliance because it knows how organic and how powerful this organization is. 
Okay, uh, thanks, Tendai. Uh, Greg and Patrick, I'll come back to you. In fact, what I will do, I'll, I'll come back to all the panelists uh, just now to just give us, you know, your final words. And then Greg and, um, and Patrick, you'll also include your responses to the questions that you asked because I'm running out of time and there are so many people um, who have raised their hands. So I need to take a, at least a few more before, be, 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 before we, we, we come to the final words. Um, Ifram, Mubai, please, can we at least, we know already what the problems are. Let's try and stick to the theme of this um, uh, discussion today. What is the way forward? So let's not go back and talk about the problems. We know what they are. Please, if, if, if you don't have, you know, specific solutions or um, comments to do with the topic, uh, I, I will have to, 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 mute your, to, to mute your mic. So Ephraim, please go ahead. Ephraim Mumbai. Okay, I think we've lost Ephraim. Uh, Godfrey, Godfrey Mutindi. Thank you so much. My, my question is in two parts. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Can you make my question is my question is in two parts. Mm -hmm. the first of all, on on Mr. I think it's Mr. Moss. He, he started at the issues of governance in Zimbabwe, democracy, human rights. He did not start where Zidera is. Let's be honest in our analysis. Zidera has got a has got two premises, which is one. Zimbabwe is a threat to the US interests. And then two, Zimbabwe was supposed to compensate the white farmers according to the Sadak Tribunal. That's what the document says. And all these other issues of uh, uh, democracy and uh, 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 human rights come later. So let's, let's discuss things as they are. We are, we, are, we, are, we are researchers and we are professionals. Second thing, I'm asking about the, the uh, compensation for the white farmers, the 3.5 billion that is being reported that Zimbabwe is going to compensate the white farmers. Could that be also um, an issue that we are supposed to discuss here? In, the, in that one there, how are the partners involved, the cooperation partners in the, the international community? These are really good questions, but we, we really have run out of time. And what we wanted from people in this section is just to tell us what needs to happen now. So I'm sorry, that will, we'll have to bring in another conversation. So let me get one more from the floor. Basically, we want to know what is the way forward. So if anyone has that, Dominique uh, Mutanga. Yeah, uh, thanks, Violet. Uh, just two, two, a two-part question for Tendai Beti, who spoke about the military. Um, you said that they, con they brought up some concerns in 2007 prior to the GNU. My question is, if the military, as we know, are the power brokers, has there been any efforts to engage them directly uh, to discuss the way forward the resettlement? And then number two, what happened to those military guys that you spoke to? Are they dead? Are they alive? And if they are alive, why can we not engage them as part of the resettlement? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Dominique. And I'm afraid we, we just have too many uh, uh, hands raised right now and not enough time. So I'm really sorry about that, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but I need to go and uh, get final comments from the panelists. Um, and in your final comments, uh, please, can you at least just tell us what you think is the way forward in just a minute and a half and not more than that, so that we can then end with the, the convener of this uh, um, discussion, Dr. Mandaza, with last words. So let me start with Todd Moss. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Violet. Uh, look, uh, on the Zadera question, I'm gonna paste into chat the link to Zadera. Everyone should read it for themselves. It's, uh, it's, it's four pages, it's very clear. The United States, you know, there, there's not one American citizen uh, who's had a farm stolen. So the idea that, that the US government 
uh, the policy towards Zimbabwe is about white farmers is just wrong. So I'll, I'll share that uh, so everyone can see. Uh, look, the, the international community, including the United States, stands ready to support uh, a genuine reform process in Zimbabwe. But given the behavior of the government over the past 10 years, we will not underwrite um, anything that leads to more theft and more eruption parties and civil society is so important that they have to continue to speak up and stand up and that's where the international community will, will support them. It is not for the United States or Britain or Europeans or the Chinese to dictate terms of a negotiation you know, I, I wish that uh, the AU would play that role, but I'm not very optimistic. Um, uh, so whatever process that is, there, Zimbabwe is going to need resources and support. Uh, and the, you know, the US and others are ready to do that, but not in a way that's going to make things worse uh, rather than better. Um, so that's... Um, those are my comments, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to uh, to talk to everyone. So, thank you, Ibo. Thank you, Violet, uh, and all of the panelists and, and commenters. And thank you, Todd Moss and uh, Professor Stephen Chen. Yes, thank you very very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, it's been a pleasure to participate on this panel. I agree with what the other speakers have said in that the final breakthrough, the final solution, if there is one for Zimbabwe, has got to be led by Zimbabweans. Uh, however, this is not just Zimbabweans who live in Zimbabwe. Many millions have had to leave Zimbabwe. So what you need is a unified movement. I'm not really sure that the opposition parties have reached out sufficiently to the Zimbabwean diaspora internationally. There's at least a million of them here in the United Kingdom, about four million at least in South Africa. You come across them in many, many countries and other parts of Africa, uniting them into a major pressure group. In other words, these are people who put pressure on their host governments to put pressure on Zimbabwe. So unifying the diaspora as a key part of civil society, not just concentrating on an internal civil society, but international civil society, using electronic civil society mechanisms, which I reiterate the opposition has not been very good at doing uh, so far. That I think is gonna be a key and critical part of going forward in the future. There's one other very controversial way which requires as it were some back room, back channels of diplomacy. Uh, that is that if we're gonna be brutally honest, we talk about the securocrats in Zimbabwe. I actually have very grave doubts about their military capacity and military professionalism in a real conflict situation. So using the good offices of senior military people from other countries, preferably other African countries, to talk to them about what true military professionalism means, uh, this could be a very interesting adjunct back channel that the primary channel for change has really got to be by civil society, international Zimbabwean civil society. Okay. All right. No, thank you very much, Professor Stephen Chen. Uh, Tendai Viti. Tendai? I think you have. Yes, to... yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So three points are critical, uh, Violet. Uh, the first one is that um, there has to be the agency of Zimbabweans uh, across the length and breadth uh, of our society, and including uh, compatriots uh, in the in the diaspora. I think convergence is is is, is coming. We are seeing signs of it. Uh, the Zimbabwean Lives Matter, uh, you know, you know, you know, movement. Something something is brewing. Something is being uh, uh, born. Uh, the MDC Alliance will play its part. It has always played its part. It will provide uh, the necessary uh, leadership. Number two, it is the external refereeing, the role uh, of uh, uh, the international community, particularly the region, particularly uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, South Africa. Third is the obligation that we need to bring uh, ZANU-PF uh, to the table. 
in my respectful view, I don't think it's going to be possible uh, under Emerson Mnangagwa. I suspect that any dialogue, any possible dialogue can only take place after Emerson Mnangagwa is gone, but that dialogue must focus on reform. That dialogue must create an implementation mechanism. That dialogue must include to, 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 to an implementation period, which will then lead to free and fair elections. It can be done. Uh, we've done it before. We didn't do a good job, but I think uh, there will be change in this country sooner rather than later. Okay, thank you, Tendai Biti from the NDC. Um, Muleya Mananyanda. Oh, thank you very much. So I, my last point is uh, where I ended, that uh, international solidarity is going to be important in order to uh, change this, yes, from Zimbabweans, but Zimbabweans cannot do it alone. We're going to have to work uh, very, very hard to get uh, people across the region, across other countries to be part of this. So in whatever way we can, those people on this call, those of us working in the organizations we work, we must reach out to um, other people to uh, be part of the movement. Thank you, Malaya. Tiseke Kasambala. Um, thanks, Violet. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, my, my final point is that any um, discussions around negotiations and settlements must not be limited to political settlements alone, but must be premised on human rights, must be premised on democracy and governance, but also move beyond and engage the Zimbabwean citizens, be widely consultative, engage civil society organizations as well. And most importantly, must specifically address the issues of accountability and justice in Zimbabwe. Finally, I would like to say that even though there is regional paralysis when it comes to um, African governments and regional governments in Southern Africa, regional support remains key. And uh, this moment provides an opportunity. There is momentum in countries like South Africa and there is support from COSATU, from South African citizens and others within the region across Southern Africa for um, uh, um, uh, democracy and human rights in Zimbabwe. And so let's take advantage of that opportunity. Let's take advantage um, of the momentum. Thank you very much, Tiseke. And um, Greg Mills? Oh, so, ah, thank you very much. I'll try to unmute myself. Just very briefly on the a question about opposition politics in South Africa, the two major opposition movements, which is the opposition lead, or the, the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, has nearly 21% uh, of votes in South Africa, and uh, uh, the Economic Freedom Fighters, the EFF, uh, nearly 11%. So that together is nearly 32% of the vote. And of course, they take a very strong line, albeit from different perspectives on Zimbabwe. Uh, um, and uh, Julius Malema has been particularly outspoken on, the, on this issue recently. South African government's interested in things that make them look bad and interested in things uh, that make them look weak uh, and interested in acting against issues uh, or for issues that are to do with jobs and the economy. And that's why their support has, has been driven down uh, to just 57% of the electorate. Really, it's about the combination of corruption and economic performance. And my last point I would make is and sorry, Zimbabwe plays into those two issues of, of corruption and economic performance, is COVID has created a slightly different, well, slightly a very different world, uh, different circumstances, even in Zimbabwe. It's created undoubtedly in the short term opportunities to eat. Um, and we've seen that here in South Africa, and it's also been the case in Zimbabwe. But it's, it's dramatically increased the costs and speed of failure. Uh, and as the sign behind me suggests, uh, don't let a crisis go to waste. And that's something that the opportunity in Zimbabwe uh, should not do. They need to be voluble. Uh, they need to uh, uh, 
propose a series of dialogues and they need to make a plausible case for transition to something better for Zimbabweans. Thank, thank you, Greg Mills. And uh, from our last speaker, Patrick Smith. Patrick, you have to unmute. I'm trying to. Yes, yeah. I think I think that's working now. Okay. Yeah, um, fine. Um, yeah, I just got a message ab about uh, the Sudan thing again, uh, which has pro uh, prompted some some interest and maybe criticism as well. Um, one one caller said um, that he thought the parallel with, between Zimbabwe was closer with the Egyptian revolution, the Sudanese re revolution. I, I'd say, yeah, definitely from a sort of socio-political analysis, there are you know, cl closer parallels with the sort of Nasserite nationalist regime in um, in Egypt than there are with the Islamist regime in Sudan. The point being that uh, what happened in Egypt was tragic because the people got onto the streets, demanded political change, they got some backing from the military, they kicked out uh, Mubarak, and then they had an Islamist regime that failed, and now they've got a dictator who's as bad as Mubarak, probably worse. Uh, so what the Sudanese are trying to do by having this extended transition to talk about... You have to be brief because yeah, I... It, uh, okay, I so, sorry. I'm just, I'm just saying, it just sort of the Sudanese again experiment shows I mean, the importance of this idea that everyone in Zimbabwe has been talking about, this transitional authority that can actually start to change institutions and start to change the society, but more importantly, bring the entire society together into that process of debate, argument, and institutional renewal. And I think that that's you know a more coherent and effective way forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I'm afraid we've run out of time. So let me bring in Dr. Ibo Mandaza. Dr. Mandaza, I think you only have a minute. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. I'll have two minutes. Uh, well, I think this has lived up to the expectations and I'll have occasion to thank the, the, the panelists and the discussants at, at the end. I think we have established uh, a viable link between the national, regional, and international perspectives on Zimbabwe. And we hope that in the future we can actually galvanize that linkage uh, uh, through the kind of people that we have on the panel and through them uh, to put pressure towards some kind of settlement in Zimbabwe. Secondly, I, I think uh, we, the role of South Africa has been, has been, has been uh, quite central. I know that uh, the, this, this afternoon I had, a, I had an interview with uh, one of the TV stations and uh, unfortunately before they, they, didn't, they, they didn't know I was listening, but I had complaints that, oh, well, Zimbabweans, why are they bothering South Africans? They should do their own thing, you know? They should do enough to, to free themselves. And I want to just remind ourselves, but also in the context of the discussion, the role of the international community I pointed out during the discussion that in South Africa, without the global movement, the anti-apartheid movement, there may not have been liberation in South Africa. There may not be democracy in South Africa. So we cannot underestimate the role of the international community, the global community, the African, the continental effort. Nigerians, for example, raised a million, one dollar each, one, uh, one naira each to support the struggle in Southern Africa. So I think that also refers to our discussion today. Thirdly, I think we have learned uh, as Zimbabweans the need to define, refine, and present a settlement model that we want. Tendai spoke a lot about it, but I think we need, uh, even through the NCP, the civic society, the diaspora, to refine this concept of the transition authority as necessary so that we are ready for it when it comes up. Last but not least, I think we want to call upon the international community and South Africa in particular, the region SADC, to, to stop the violence, the abductions, the torture in Zimbabwe. That doesn't require a meeting. Let Emerson Nangagwa's counterparts phone him. Let the, the, the British Prime Minister the State Department in the US, just make it known that the violence, the abductions, the torture of young activists should stop immediately. 
And I wish now again to thank uh, the panelists, Todd, Stephen, Tendai, Leah, Seke, uh, Greg, and Patrick. Thank you very much indeed. You really made a difference to this session. I think it's a, it will be a memorable one. 400 uh, or more on Zoom, thousands, thousands on Facebook. Thank you very much. And th thanks to Violet. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibu, Ibu Mandaze. And we have come to the end of our broadcast. Thanks to all our panelists, uh, discussions, and contributors. We are sorry we weren't able to get as many of you in the call, um, but next time. And uh, this broadcast, as you've heard from Dr. Mandaze, is brought to you by the Cyprus Trust Policy Dialogue Forum. My name is Violet Gonda. Have a good night. <laughs>